Uh, very good morning and uh, good afternoon and good evening to all the panelists and the uh, audiences attending the session. For today's workshop will be on optimization of levelized cost of green energy. This session has been organized in partnership with uh, Snyder Electric. So uh, I'll be introducing all the panelists and then we'll be handing over the session to Mr. Praveen Niyogi, who is both chair and moderator for this session. Our first panelist, Mr. Uh, Praveen Niyogi, who is chair and moderator for the session. Mr. Niyogi is an engineering graduate for Jadapur University and holds a diploma in finance and accounting management and has a long experience in power and coal sectors with exposure to policy reforms, regulation, and organizational design, having worked to CSC Limited and as chief executive, Noida Power Company Limited. Our next speaker, Mr. Anil Kumar Kadam, he is currently the electric vice chair of Smart Grid Division and uh, also the uh, energy sector and digital ent enthusiast. And he, is a over, he has over 19 years of experience in solution architecting, uh, technical marketing, pre-sales of smart city and smart grid utility automation, energy automation systems, network protection, etc. Currently working on end-to-end -end smart city solution architecture and strategy profiling, city profile type, uh, typology of city, uh, stakeholders, etc. Our next speaker, Mr. Srinivas Jampani is the senior vice president at Greenco. Mr. Jampani's responsibilities include strategy, global market, business development, digital transformation, and new business growth. He has over 14 years of experience in power and natural gas markets, trading and asset management, energy system modeling, and predictive analytics. Our next speaker, Mr. Manoj Kumar Upadhyay, is currently working as deputy advisor in Energy Vertical Niti Ayo, Government of India. He has been working on government policy and regulation in environmental economics and climate change, renewable energy generation, conventional energy generation, transmission and distribution, allocation of and supply of coal, gas, and petroleum products. Our next speaker, Mr. Avishek Ranjan, is currently senior VP, strategy, utilities, and retail in Renew Power. Avishek has over two decades of experience in power and information technology sectors in India. He has been responsible for implementing projects in the areas of energy efficiency, demand side management, renewable integration, and uh, solar rooftop, and storage solutions for distribution network, EV charging infrastructure, et cetera. Our next speaker, Mr. Ketan Dave, he is the head of engineering for Adani Green Energy Limited. He has joined Adani Group in December 2018 as head of engineering for renewables business. He has 27 years of experience in design and engineering of AI, so GIS turnkey projects, EHB substation projects, power distribution, Solar or wind plant engineering, MP switch gear, and transmission line. Our next speaker, Mr. Rajiv Gyani, is the additional director with International Solar Alliance. He is professionally a mechanical engineer and a certified energy auditor, working in the field of renewable energy and energy efficiency in 1988. Worked in Chhattisgarh State Renewable Energy Development Agency as project in charge for all the projects related to renewable energy and energy conservation at district level, regional level, and state level. Our next speaker, Mr. Rahul Valvalkar, is uh, Rahul is, is the founder and executive director uh, for customized, uh, customized Energy Solutions and also the Indian Sto Energy Storage Alliance. He is involved in providing inputs for demand response, energy storage, and smart grid policy to government agencies in US and India, as well as has provided inputs to multilateral agencies such as IRENA, IE, and ADB. With this, uh, I'm handing over the session to Mr. Praveen Niyogi, who is the chair and moderator of the session. Uh, over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Sudha Sattar. And thank you, organizers, uh, you know, for this uh, session, you know, which is uh, quite contemporary. Uh, it might seem a little off track because we are talking of uh, levelized cost of energy, green energy per se. But, you know, it's, it's highly contextual. Uh, essentially, uh, to the welcome, I, I also welcome the, the panelists, you know, I, I find that it's, it's a diverse group of speakers uh, coming, coming from different fields, uh, representing policy as well as industry uh, perspective. Uh, it's, it's just a workshop, so, uh, you know, it, it gives us some breathing space because uh, we, what we can do is to experiment with ideas, turn them over, and try and see whether we can reach some tangible conclusions. ISGF is particularly known, as you know, for coming out with new publications, uh, which are 
you know, seminal papers on topics which are of interest. And as a group, uh, we would be doing a service if some of our recommendations can be transformed into a white paper, which uh, ISGF may like contemplating. So that's the background. Uh, let me just uh, go over to some of the, the, the points that we would like to discuss today and try and set set a context for all of you so that you know we share a platform from where we can start you know firing our own ideas and casting our imagination wide so so that's the, the first slide please good would you move on to the sector yeah so just to set the context, you know, how critical is LCOE? It is. See, if, if we talk about our COP27 targets, you know, we are saying that the share of non-fossil generation capacity will be as much as 500 gigawatts. And if we break them up, the share of renewable is going to be 435 uh, gigawatts. I'm sorry, it's 500 gigawatts in all. Now, that's not, that's not the end. We are also saying that the share of renewable energy would be 50% in terms of energy of the total generation mix. So, which means that, you know, if we have to have such deployment at scale, obviously the levelized cost of energy will have to be such as it can be carried through the entire expanse of project execution and fulfillment. So that's one. So it, it's it's mission critical. Two, you know, it's it's also going to serve the overall purpose of meeting the SDG seven goals. And what are those? Just in a nutshell, you know, we are trying to make reliable, affordable, and modern energy accessible to all. And we are also trying to increase the RE share in, in, in the to total energy mix. So if that be so, LCOE is going to be highly mission critical, without which, as I said, the deployment at, sports, at scale would not be feasible because, you know, we, we, we will not be able to create the demand pool unless the cost is affordable as well as the quality of supply reliable. It, it also has got a market context. See, if you see, if, if we visualize today what's happening is you know we we have the g dam and the g dam markets the green day ahead and tom ahead markets in which some of us you know some of the participants uh, you know must be must be uh, you know be a part of now see overall the progress of selling green energy in the market has been just about 640 to 650 million units over a period of let's say four months august to december so that's not even one percent of the short term market now as we move ahead and we make our energy sector more vibrant the reliance will be on deeper market designs and deeper market designs always include time and space granularity. So if renewable energy is to participate both at scale and on merit, LCOE is going to be the deciding factor. And I, I, I'll tell you why, because it's, it's sort of a enabling participation in the short term market. But LCOE is also going to play a dominant role when we enter into ETS, uh, long, medium term uh, contracts. So there again, you know, uh, the more affordable the energy is, obviously there will be more traction on the demand side. So in terms of business continuity, see, let's not forget that, you know, what, what, we, uh, what we see as the renewable energy cost at the bus bar, it's not a not not a standalone situation because there are added costs, you know, which are known as impact spread of RE integration. So there is the cost of balancing, there is the cost of transmission, there is a cost of uh, standby charges payable to uh, the the, the coal-based power plants. There is also a cost of uh, 
DSM that emerges in certain situations. And there is also the cost of backing down of power plants. So all taken together, CEA's estimate is that the added cost sums up to two rupees two fifteen. Now, if the if the levelized cost is something which we have been able to engineer on, and we have been able to optimize, obviously, you know there is a set of that's available to the industry. And why I'm saying this here, see wherever the green tariff has been offered to consumers, it has generally been seen that the added costs have come into play. And there is a differential between the variable cost of fossil based power generation and RE power. And that's why, you know, you see a tariff, an incremental tariff of 65 paisa being implemented in Mumbai. So, again, the LCOE becomes a fulcrum on which we, we can apply the levers. And lastly, see if LCOE is manageable, then what? A, the new age technology take off. One, as, you, as we all know, the, the share of electricity cost in green hydrogen production is as much as 55 to 70 percent, depending on the location uh, where it's, it's employed. So if that be so, LCOE obviously has a critical. Two, so long LCOE again is affordable, manageable, then you know, they, they, we economize the electrification efforts in, in, in our power sector. So it, it does support EV charging, does support V2G integration, does support BSSS coming into play uh, when, when, when it, it is serves the capacity market or assists, assists in farming up RE supply or plays a role in shaving the peak load. Next slide, Suman. Next slide, yeah. So this is the Indian context. What we saw in the earlier slide was the, the, the role of LCOE in the energy transition context. The Indian context is a bit picky. Now, what you see here, you know, this is a bit dated, but it's, it's an analysis carried out by CEW. Based on tariff modeling, these are not the real tariffs, but this is the modeling they have done based on a moving average of tariff, and we will find that the cost of finance in, in, in case of solar tariff is as much as 50 to 65 percent, and in case of wind, it's 62 percent. The point is, you know, this is the question, you know, I have now for the panelists. Would you now see that there is headroom in improving the situation, or there are tailwinds, you know, which can possibly try to leverage by way of improving the OM expenses, for example, by bringing in digital solutions. So the components I'm not going through because solar cells, solar parks all have a role in, in the tariff construct as well as the, the, the components for land leasing, balance of uh, system, etc. in both solar and wind tariff. The, the point here very clearly is, and this CEW analysis was quoted by UNDP in its Human Development Report of 2020, uh, in this uh, tariff modeling. But the point it has made is that tariff falls sharply when bids are, one, backed by government guarantees, and two, there are credible off-takers. And we have seen this. We have seen this, seen the situation unfolding in, in places like Rewa, or in other situations or in other destinations where we have the benefit of a solar park uh, providing the plug and play option. Again, you know, digital solutions will have a, have a role because it will optimize plant and operations and hence improve the bankability of the project. The next slide, so that's it. So, this is the last slide, so I won't take much of your time, but uh, you know, this is, these are basically pointers on which we can spend some time in the next, in the course of next uh, one and a half to, uh, to two hours, where you know, the panelists, uh, you know, you may consider either dwelling on one or more of the, more of the, the bullets, uh, the, the choice is yours, but the issues I wanted to flag is that, you know, what are the perspectives of improving the factor costs, 
the regulatory costs and the social costs in order to have a, have a telling impact on LCOA. What would be the operational challenges? Again, you know, whether there are headwinds or whether we can convert the headwinds into tailwinds by tangible actions uh, taken by the industry and also at the policy level so in terms of technology or adoption. You know, I, I've just cited some of the examples, but the choice is yours as to what you would like to speak on. On process adaptation with focus on digital solutions and adoption of digital twins. On framework and ecosystem, what indeed is needed for policy support and what needs to be done. The market readiness and expansion, how we can have the demand side participation reinforced or do we look at new models? like virtual PPAs and contract for difference. And finally, the hybrid solutions. Uh, uh, and what should be the considerations for implementing these solutions uh, under requirements of a flatter generation pattern or the complementarity of resources which will produce RTC power or the economic choice of transmission system. So with this, you know, uh, I, I, I'll stop here. I'll, I'll request the next panelist to come over. But before that, uh, basically, as I said, you know, if we have some of the uh, discussions we are having today translated into a white paper, you know, that would be quite productive. One, who is, you know, basically our, before I move on to speakers, uh, our future is both digital and both, and also green. And hence, you know, we'll start with the video just just to liven up the proceedings and then we'll move to the panelists one by one. So, the Shatta, back to you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Simran, kindly play the video, please. Good. Thank you. And uh, since uh, we are talking of a digital and greener future, Mr. Adam, would you like to go first? Thank you, sir. Thank you. So uh, I have a small uh, presentation to show. Can I share my screen? Am I audible? Yes, you are. And uh, just one request as a housekeeping rule, you know, we, we have uh, got uh, 10 minutes for each of the three speakers. So there would be a timer working, I suppose. And secondly, the idea is that, uh, you know, as we have our turns of uh, making our presentation or presenting the points, you know, we'll like, like to rotate the discussion among speakers so that, you know, it becomes very lively and engaging. Thank you. Sure. Please go ahead. Sure. So, so, so what I will uh, do at this point in time is I'll keep my, uh, it's on the discussion mode. Maybe at some point in time, I'll get my presentation and it, when it is very relevantly intense at that point in time. Let me switch on my video. <clears throat> so, um, uh, what is important, see, I'm, I'm, we are from the technology side uh, of the, uh, you know, the whole value chain. Uh, and uh, our experience is more on enabling uh, the renewable uh, operators, renewable power producers with the technology which can help them uh, to be more efficient and uh, do more things there so my perspective is from that perspective uh, that level now there are two phases uh, uh, for uh, the constraints outside stays and it will evolve and there are a lot of stakeholders but for a renewable operator or an investor he has to see how he can build an efficient plant we build it very efficiently and operate it very efficiently out of all the external constraints so he has design and build phase, which is one part of the story. Another is he has, uh, you know, operate and maintain phase. Um, so uh, conventionally, uh, digital was only employed in the operate phase, where there was some amount of SCADAs and people were looking at the SCADA to see how his each equipment is operating 
whether am I extracting maximum out of uh, all my investments. That means to the irradiation level is the production correlating. You know, to the wind speed is the production correlating. Am I try? Am 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 I able to you know evacuate maximum and so on and so forth. You know, or am I uh, you know following the grid constraints or something like that. But with the advent of digital technology, there is a possibility to bring digital from every aspect of the value chain. When I say every aspect of the value chain, how efficiently is he coordinating his multi-facet constructions? You know, there are there, there could be multiple hundreds of sites where the construction is going on with the, because the ambition is very big. And if uh, the project uh, team do not have a construction digital twin to animate, you know, what is the material in, what is the amount of you know, construction done, you know, and whether all the men and machineries have been utilized well, probably he may lose good amount of cost, which could have probably helped him if he had he optimized it, his LCOC, LCOE would have been optimized. You know, so if you have a digital construction management deployed in the renewable industry, we guarantee that there will be sufficient uplift of optimization of LCOE. So that's one part of the story. Now, when we say digital twin, be it electrical systems, be it mechanical systems, if you are able to model it beyond 3D, you know, three dimensional view, two dimensional was conventionally there. So if you bring the third dimension, which is more intuitive in nature, if you bring the fourth dimension, which is the cost, the fifth dimension is the time aspects and the sixth dimension, which is called sustainability of what you do. So you have a six dimension digital print, which helps you to reduce the cost during construction and be faster to the market. Now, how does this help in the maintain and the operate phase, operate and maintain phase? So there's a possibility to get the digital twin to have a single version of truth for all operations and all maintenance in the control rooms, in the you know at the corporate level or the enterprise level, so that when you augment the real-time data with the digital twin, it is much more efficient to operate it. You can efficient, you can improve efficiency, you can improve reliability, and you can you know uh, improve resiliency. That's another very important aspect because with respect to cyber threats from digital, you can improve resiliency. So this is for maintain phase. Now, in the market side, if you are able to create a platform where you can orchestrate demand, you know, with of course with change of regulations and stuff like that, you are able to orchestrate and real time connect different participants, so that platform can directly connect with your operational platform and help you to, you know, get better prices, better compete in the system. So therefore, I call this as data as a gold mine. And data starting from, you know, uh, design, build, operate, and maintain in a digital for twin format can definitely help LCOE be optimized under the control of an IPP or the entire, you know, institution. You know, the outside constraint stays. So that's my that's my, uh, you know, take on this, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kadam. Uh, you know, I think you have been very crisp to the point. And it's something I, I, I came to know, I, I, I learned uh, that, you know, you are talking of a single version digital twin, the scope of which can be expend, extended from the construction build stage to the OLM stage. Yes. And then, you know, you have a whole lot of, lot of data flowing and that's why you are saying data is the new oil or it, it's a new engine. Uh, which drives the optimization exercise. So, so when you are, you know, you are so particular in saying that you know it, it's going to, uh, you know, C O E at the build stage, but you know beyond that, it's also going to optimize your OM expenses. Yes. And you know, the, the, and now now there is an impact I can see because if you if you see those the, that tariff modeling, so OM as a component in the yes. tariff build up in the levelized tariff construct, right? Yes. And if I can have a forecasted OM, which is already optimized, yes. so I, I am now producing a direct influence on what LCO is going to be about. And that, yes, that will be my, my bidding strength. So thank you very much you know, for the insight. As I said, I didn't know this, and I, am, I have learned a new aspect today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Rahul, I understand that you know you are in some kind of a hurry, 
So we would like to bring you over. And if you are not staying, then you know we'll have a few questions to round off with you in case you have to leave early. So Rahul, it's over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prabir ji, and uh, apologies uh, for the rest of the panelists for uh, having to leave early. Uh, but yeah, uh, so I'll quickly uh, get started with uh, my uh, presentation. I'm going to focus on more about the levelized cost of RE plus uh, storage hybrids. Uh, so um, as most of you know, I'm the founder and president of India Energy Storage Alliance, which we are actually celebrating 10 years uh, this year. We started in 2012 with uh, just five member companies, which has now grown to more than 175 members and additional 30 plus partners, including ISGF, which has been a partner throughout the last 10 years of the journey. And uh, I think ISUW has become a very critical part of the knowledge sharing. So again, thank you very much, Reji and ISGF team for giving us this opportunity. But also, uh, some of you may not know that uh, uh, Customized Energy Solutions is the company behind IEA and CES has a more than 20 years experience of electricity markets including actually operating assets so we manage now more than 15 gigawatt of assets around the globe including more than 1500 megawatt hour of energy storage assets so what I'll be sharing in the presentation is uh, more from the uh, actual operational and optimization experience what we have of managing many RE plus uh, now storage projects as well. Uh, so if you see over the uh, last few years, uh, storage has been growing very rapidly around the globe. Uh, this is not actually a latest chart. Uh, US Department of Energy has been upgrading the database. So the latest chart is not available, but this is almost a year old chart. But you can see that unlike uh, uh, 10 years back where maybe most of the activity was just focused in Japan or US, now storage uh, deployments are starting to take over uh, around the globe. And we do hope that in uh, next two, three years, even India will also emerge as a hotspot for uh, this area. And this is partly driven by the renewable growth in India. And there uh, we are seeing a very clear now uh, graduation of energy storage where originally it was uh, being looked at in the fringes only at the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy to where now in last six months, particularly Ministry of Power has uh, uh, taken a very strong lead in looking at energy storage as part of the overall grid optimization. And I'm happy to inform that uh, uh, some of the work which has taken place in last six months uh, will be resulting in announcement of a new energy storage policy by Ministry of Power uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, now, the question is many times I think we talk about renewables and uh, I think in India particularly we are fascinated about the cost of the renewables where the levelized cost obviously has been coming down very rapidly for renewables. So the one question which everyone thinks assumes is that, oh, we can just keep on adding more and more renewables because now uh, the renewable has become the cheapest sources. Uh, but unfortunately, when you are having to balance the grid, uh, just adding more and more renewables will not uh, help. Uh, uh, you need to make sure that you can actually balance the generation with the uh, demand. Uh, and the demand growth also could be changing quite drastically. I think we are at the cusp of the EV revolution. And some of the things, depending on how the charging infrastructure evolves, how the uh, customers decide to charge the vehicles, I think some of the load shapes could be completely different where uh, we may have like a lot of public uh, charging infrastructure which can uh, actually complement solar by providing additional load during the day. But if on the other hand side, if people end up relying more on uh, at home charging and people st start charging in the evening after they come home after 7 p.m., 8 p.m., then suddenly actually the evening peak, which is already a critical uh, issue for discounts, will end up uh, becoming a bigger issue. And that has a huge impact because that means that you need to substantially keep on increasing on the distribution uh, infrastructure. And that would actually add substantially to the levelized cost for end consumers, which includes the cost of transmission, distribution, and everything. Uh, many times in India, we have been now fascinated with like this under two rupee cost of solar energy. And we talk about that as a game changer. But practically, if you see most of the customer segments uh, uh, beyond maybe the uh, below poverty line customers, 
then there is no customer who is getting electricity for less than 6 rupee or 7 rupee and many times there are customer segments who are paying even somewhere between 8 to 12 rupees so i think we need to get away from this fascination with the sub 2 rupee or 1 rupee electricity kind of thing that is just the bottom down to the race and it's just a, a fictionary number we need to start looking at the levelized cost in terms of the total cost of the delivery to the customer and there actually now re plus storage has come up in a, a big way uh, partly because of the uh, growth which has happened in manufacturing. Uh, so just to give you some numbers, back in 2010, the global manufacturing capacity for advanced uh, batteries, particularly lithium ion batteries, was almost around just 10 gigawatt hour uh, annual capacity. And the prices for lithium ion batteries that time were at a cell level were more than $1,000 per kilowatt hour. Now, come to 2020, the global manufacturing capacity has increased beyond 500 gigawatt hour annual capacity and the cell prices have started getting closer to the $100. So we have seen 10x reduction in the cost of the uh, some of the storage technologies, particularly lithium ion batteries and even some of the other chemistries also are getting scaled up in terms of the manufacturing and they can also get similar prices. But what I want to highlight from the right hand side uh, uh, image is that the capital cost is not the only important thing for the looking at the storage cost and this is something which i hope that i can communicate very clearly with the audience here because in india we have this fascination when we are going to get a hundred dollar storage when we are going to get a fifty dollar storage but even with the storage technologies which were deployed or which were available five years back if you actually optimize the storage technology in terms of choosing the right technology, choosing the right charging, discharging rate, uh, optimizing the uh, uh, state of the charge, uh, you can actually increase the cycle life of it and you can have a very good levelized cost uh, uh, even right now. Uh, and that's where actually around the globe companies like AES, uh, Next Era, Race America have taken the lead and each of them have now portfolio of more than 1000 megawatt hour of storage which uh, they have deployed on a purely commercially viable project. So we need to get off our seats, uh, stop just looking at presentations and start working on really deploying uh, such projects and optimizing it. Uh, when we are looking at uh, levelized cost, uh, uh, some of the other parameters which come into effect is definitely cycle life and round trip efficiency uh, because you need to make sure that whatever energy you are storing, you are not losing just in terms of shifting the time shifting it as well as uh, in terms of the levelized cost, the cycle life has a huge implication and that's a part where you get batteries of 1000 cycles and you have batteries which can last more than 10,000 cycles. And they may have a price difference which may be 50 percent or even in case of some cases 100 percent but if you have a 10x increase in your cycle life then in terms of your levelized costs the costlier battery may end up becoming a cheaper so this is a part where i again hope that uh, audience takes this learning that it is not only about uh, what is the cost of the storage but you need to start looking into all the technical parameters and when you start looking at this, uh, this is just a one scenario, but uh, this is something simulation we had done a uh, couple of years back where we had shown that just in terms of the tariff add up for storage, uh, if you are doing just one hour storage addition, then actually it becomes more costly because your balance of the system, your inverter, all your uh, EMS and other costs that gets added on to just a one hour storage. But if you are doing a four hour storage, then that all the cost gets divided across the uh, four hours of storage. So the levelized cost for adder comes down. But that trend, again, you can see that we had projected that from uh, for four hour storage from like seven rupee adder, it would come down below four rupees over next five, six years. But depending on how you are blending it, because most of the RE projects would need maybe 50% of its capacity. So if you are doing a 100 megawatt uh, 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 solar or wind project, you may need only 25 or 50 megawatt of storage uh, for four hours for shifting part of it to the peak times. And if you do that, then the levelized or blended cost for the such RE plus storage uh, can already be uh, uh, below 5 rupees and it is expected to get below 4 rupees and now the question is okay 4 rupees is definitely more than 2 rupees so should we just not do anything and wait for that number to come down to 2 rupees or should we say that no 4 rupees is a great price for a dispatchable renewable resource which can help us optimize our transmission distribution investments in the system and we need to start deploying that and we need to start moving towards that.
so uh, this is again the numbers what i showed were at a high level with a simple spreadsheet calculation but when you are doing commercial grade projects you need to look at actually daily hourly dispatch cycles how many cycles you are doing at a full discharge how many cycle at a partial discharge uh, so you need much more sophisticated analysis than what can be done with a spreadsheet so that's where we have developed this platform called comets comprehensive market evaluation for storage uh, which has been used by more than 200 companies over the last decade for building more than uh, two gigawatt hour of projects around the globe and you can get detailed financial analysis because again when you are bidding for many large rfps which are coming up right now like the seki rfp or ntpc rfp uh, you need to assume a lot of things in terms of how the storage is going to get dispatched and provide certain warranties and if you don't take care of that and if you just do it on a simple financial spreadsheets you may be taking huge risk uh, we have seen it even in us where even some of the bigger companies like byd and others have faced significant issues and claims on the warranties because they did not model the realistic operations of how the storage will get dispatched and provided seven year, 10 year warranties. And then within two years, three years, actually those warranties were called in for. So uh, most of the times the storage companies do not have that type of a margins to provide a extra set of uh, storage asset within the warranty period. Uh, just by taking mistake on this. So these are the kind of things which are very important, particularly in the context of how the RFP and tenders are happening in India. Other last thing I would like to mention is that uh, one uh, positive thing which has happened is that over the last three years, uh, led by Prime Minister and Sri Amitabh Khan, that Niti Aayog, India has uh, uh, gone ahead with a very strong uh, uh, production link incentive program for battery manufacturing which had set a goal for getting 50 gigawatt hour manufacturing and in fact right now there is a bids come in for more than 130 gigawatt hour of manufacturing which should be result should be announced any day now and before end of the march the uh, three to four companies as the winners will get uh, signed contract but we are now seeing that we will not be stopping at this 50 gigawatt hour manufacturing our expectation is that the annual demand for advanced energy storage technologies will cross 150 gigawatt hour by 2030 and from that perspective we have as iesa set a india energy storage roadmap for getting to 100 gigawatt hour manufacturing by 2030 and 500 gigawatt hour by 2035 so to conclude, I would say that in the last 10 years, there has been a lot of uh, improvements happened on the policy framework, although unfortunately, CERC has not yet taken certain steps which industry was expecting it for a long time, including uh, having very clear ancillary service policies. Although they have issued uh, ancillary service policies, uh, the kind of uh, performance requirement they have put in are very clearly uh, to favor thermal, store, uh, thermal uh, generation, existing generation. But some of those things I think can be improved on an ongoing basis. Uh, but storage technologies are evolving, and uh, I urge everyone not to just focus on the uh, system cost reduction. There is a lot of things which you can do in terms of optimizing the uh, storage, uh, in terms of the sizing, as well as getting more life out of it, which has a bigger impact on the levelized cost. Uh, so I hope that uh, uh, we will, uh, all of us will work together and uh, take benefit of the learning curve, which is available with the storage. And R plus storage can become a, a great uh, a foundation for India to achieve our uh, climate change uh, goals. So. I would like to again once again thank uh, IGF team for the opportunity and if there are any questions happy to take. Yeah. Thanks Rahul and then, as always you have been very comprehensive and, and, and uh, I'm sometimes fascinated by the depth uh, you know which you provide to us you know uh, who have the benefit of listening to you. See uh, Rahul you know uh, two things you have said I think you know if I if I may pick up one is sure. this uh, two rupees tariff is a fiction. So it's essentially the, you have now brought in the concept. You have brought in the concept of LCOE delivered as delivered. Yes. Right. So you have also briefly touched upon that how the distribution infrastructure has to be made compatible. So that's one. Yes. You have also said that, you know, capital cost is a misnomer in the sense that, you know, you have to be very careful about how we are defining cycle life, right? And, and how basically, uh, you know, we are also redefining the, the plant efficiencies in storage included. And the, the, the EVAC, et cetera, the, the charging, 
protocols, you know, again, you know, whether there is interoperability, you know, that that again would possibly be a deciding factor in casting the net much wider. And then, of course, you know, you talked of uh, round tripping, we are talking of uh, swapping of batteries. Nothing will happen, you know, unless there are standards, standards have started. One. But Rahul, we can, can't let you go so easily. We know that, you know, you have shortage of time. First of all, you know, it has come so timely, your presentation. This morning, only Crystal has come out with a new study. And they have said that the share of RTC plant is just about one gigawatt today out of 100. Okay. <clears throat> it's going to be 5% by 2025. Provided, you know, that levelized tariff, which is 374 today, 3.74 comes down by 11 to 12 percent to 3.2 so the question to you is very specific how do you think it is happening and this re plant is saying that has to be combined with a storage application which today has 25 percent contribution in the total tariff so first question is how do you see this emerging who is you briefly speak about i'll just pose the three questions so that you take take sure. one by one who is do you think the PLI scheme to be a game changer? So it's it's a broader question. You did say that you know we have ambitions beyond 50 GWH, right? But what is the scope of bringing in new material science applications? One. The third question I will I can't resist the temptation of asking you is that we are are we only talking of BESS as the storage solution? Or are there better or cheaper options in the form of gravity-based storage or flywheel applications or even those, you know, which are uh, which are uh, sort of uh, fabricated around molten salt applications. So should we be as a nation be technology agnostic or simply focusing on BESS as and a one of or one of those and as a principal storage solution. So these are the three questions I thought of uh, proposing to you. So over to no, you. No, I think amazing. I think uh, you have posed uh, all three very right questions. Uh, but I'll start with maybe the most maybe controversial comment right now. Uh, I think this whole notion about RTC renewables is actually hurting the industry quite a lot. Uh, if you see right now, and again, uh, uh, I'll request maybe later on Abhishek or others to jump into it, but at least in all my one-on-one uh, -on -one discussion with almost every uh, utility, every discom, every customer, no one is right now actually looking for a round-the-clock renewable power. We are unnecessarily, we have coined the term and then we have defined the term in such a way that it doesn't actually mean RTC. RTC does not mean round-the-clock. RTC means that uh, we do not have, uh, uh, basically, uh, it can have 70% PLF on any given month, average PLF of 80%. That means you can deliver zero power at peak time and still get called as a RTC power, which has no value to the uh, actual customer. So that's something which we need to uh, uh, really be cautious about. I feel actually the Seki tender, which had come up two years back, which had asked for six hours of peak renewable power was the right way to go forward. I think the whole notion of RTC tenders has been pushed by uh, uh, thermal power generators where they just want to figure out if they can sell more thermal power combining with renewables uh, uh, through these RTC route. Uh, uh, so I think, again, we need to really be very careful about that. We need to start focusing on adding storage for four hours, six hour, and many times the four hour storage can get used for uh, double the amount of time. So you can use it for maybe three hours peak in the morning, three or four hours peak in the evening. So you can get actually seven hours worth of deployment uh, uh, firming up uh, along with additional six, seven hour of renewable available in a day. So 15, 16 hour kind of a dispatchable renewable power can be obtained by just adding four hour or six hour kind of a storage. And that should be the focus because on the other hand side, as soon as again, you start adding more amount of storage, technically it is possible, but it obviously becomes costlier. And some of the things we should have been doing five years back, we haven't yet done. We are just still talking about uh, proposals and RFPs and not doing the deployment. So that is my uh, request to everyone that let's focus on practical projects, which we know customers will buy and customers can afford rather than just going for these theoretical projects. 
Uh, the next question you ask about is, is PLI going to be the game changer? Uh, and I truly believe that it is because otherwise what happened with solar where we became amongst the third largest market in the world, but we were basically replacing this dependency from fuel to solar cells and I had more than 90-95% dependency on China on that. And given the geopolitical situation, I don't think we can as a country can afford that. So we need to have that opportunity and there is a global opportunity where now after COVID and uh, uh, the uh, global supply chain disruption has happened, uh, most of the even developed countries do not want to have this single source dependent on China. So all of them are looking for having an alternate a uh, source for uh, next generation technologies and although europe us all of them will try to set up manufacturing i feel that in india we can do it in a more cost effective way and india can become a not replace china but it can be a second choice so i'm not saying that india is suddenly overtake china but i would say that india can definitely aim for something like 10 percent to 20 percent of a global share for even exports and for that right now what we're talking about 100 gigawatt hour by 2030 that won't be even sufficient to just cater to the domestic demand so that's where we have already set up vision for getting to 500 gigawatt hour of manufacturing in india your last question was is it only about bss no, clearly not. Like from day one, as IESA was uh, created with a uh, position of being technology agnostic, most of the policy changes what we are asking for will be applicable even for pumped hydro, compressed energy storage, flywheels, thermal storage, all forms of technology. So uh, all the policy uh, ask which IESA has done throughout last 10 years of our career has been in a way to encourage all forms of storage technologies and let there be competition and choice amongst the market. Uh, there are very promising technologies within the battery technologies beyond uh, uh, lithium ion as well as uh, there are other uh, gravity based or other technologies. But which is there is that in terms of the BSS, the scale of manufacturing and capabilities which has got now developed because there is synergy between automotive as well as uh, uh, stationary market, it will be very difficult for any other technology to come in and uh, replace that. So many times I think we see a, a, a journal article or a lab article about a new technology and suddenly the discussions are, oh, we should not be doing uh, something with lithium ion batteries. We should wait for this technology to, to get commercialized. But that takes easily 20, 30 years in most of the cases for not just proving a technology, but then building the manufacturing process around it, building the supply chain around it, and then scaling that up. Even lithium-ion batteries were invented in 1976. They were first commercialized in 1993. And now it is another 30 years down the line where lithium-ion is still not become bigger than lead-acid batteries, which has been there for 150 years. So I think many technologies will coexist, but the scale, it is very clear that there are advanced certain technologies which will dominate next 10 years, 20 years, and we need to focus on those while encouraging innovation and new technologies. So thanks, Rahul. Uh, sure. uh, as, as always, you have been fantastic. So, sure. Thank you very much, sir. With us. Yeah, and Manoj has raised his hand, uh, so if it is okay, maybe I, I think yeah. he may have to comment something. Yeah, about sure. It. So if there is any question, you know, uh, for Rahul. Yeah, Rahul, Rahul this Manoj. Uh, as always, uh, uh, you have pointed out the right thing from industry. Only one uh, suggestion uh, from DT side that round the clock power need to be more uh, analysis analyzed and discussed because uh, last uh, two and a half year trend of renewables and the coal sectors that has given a major thrust about the RTC power. Though you are very valid about that, why we wanted RTC power. Uh, but uh, we need to have more consultation on this thing, and Niti is is doing some consultation on, on this one. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, if you see that green energy pricing and the traditional energy pricing, so on, on, on every account, whatsoever we are announcing, we are loading every incentive on the traditional power. So in a way, if you calculate, uh, if you see that uh, today the coal power, <coughs> the green energy, if you say RE and basically solar, so it's almost half of the coal power. So the trend is very different. And if you see the total ecosystem for the energy uh, on the grid, then we have to think about. But uh, we welcome your approach. And uh, we invite you uh, to the Niti. I would please suggest us. And we wanted a study on that RDC power. So Rahul, please help us. Yeah, definitely. We'll be more than happy to uh, help you on that. Because my main point is more because of the just load shape, right? If you see the load shape, 
we have a very huge difference in terms of the peak load and the valley which is there so the 24 hour thing does not require and especially for discom and again later on abhishek or others can correct me if i'm wrong but at least my firm belief is just having 70 percent or 80 percent plf irrespective of time of the day does not help discoms already discoms have been saying that they have more baseload contracts which they have signed where at night they are actually selling power at uh, uh, iex at uh, one rupee or one and a half rupees so they are also trying to figure out how to do so they have baseload contracts where they are paying average price they are selling the excess power at night at cheaper price and they are buying higher uh, uh, peak uh, peak power during daytime so what is i think right now the urgent need for next maybe at least three years five years is to focus on this six hour kind of a peaking power contracts where it, it especially storage adds two ways right because storage will always be charged at the low low price period so it also helps discounts by providing additional load which is required when they have already excess uh, base load contracts which are signed up uh, and then it also uh, helps them to uh, uh, avoid the peak power purchase so that's something which i think uh, needs to focus but in the long run like if you're looking at 10 years 20 years down the line then yes definitely i think rtc and those type of a contracts should be uh, looked at but it should not become a, a diversion where because we have just stopped doing those peak power. There was just a single tender with Seiki did where they received the tender offer from both Greenco as well as Renew for 4 rupee 30 paise as a peak power, which is a great price. Those projects should have been replicated. I'm not saying don't do RTC, but don't just say that, okay, we are just going to do a bunch of large 10, 10 gigawatt, 20 gigawatt RTC tenders and not do these peak power tenders because those are more valuable, more affordable and should be done. Uh, to totally agree, totally agree. But as I said, that we require a uh, entire ecosystem analysis because there is a lot of sure. other things to be factored on. But uh, Rahul, we we welcome your approach. And if you have time, please send us a note because we wanted to go for it. So we have to basically analyze sure. we'll that, that how much force on that we can. Thank you very much, Rahul. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And, uh, you know, uh, I I can always uh, I can uh, see that uh, you know the the interactions among the speakers have begun. So, so which is a good thing, Rahul. Thank you so much, uh, you know, for the time you spent with us and, and for the insights you have provided. Let, let, let's now see see the subject uh, from the uh, developer's perspective. And may I invite Mr. Jampani to address us? Can you all see me? Okay. Yeah, you okay? And Mr. Kundu, would you like to uh, throw the slides up or uh, however? That's fine, I'll do that. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for the earlier introduction and for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here today and um, pleased about the topic, honestly. Uh, it's, uh, it's certainly a timely one. And uh, I plan to share my views on some of the key components of a holistic framework. Uh, we talked about some of the details and how storage is a, a key enabler. Uh, Dr. Valvarkar had shed light on a lot of elements. Uh, but in order to look at this in a holistic manner, and optimize the levelized cost of green energy. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the key components. And, and to deliver least cost sustainable green energy uh, amidst India's rising electricity demand, and doing this while safeguarding grid reliability, right? And it requires really a holistic approach. Uh, this requires us to have a deep understanding of the current Indian electricity market design the structure of the supply and demand by state and, and at a nationwide level, and also the upcoming operational challenges, learning from what's happening globally as well uh, to achieve this overarching goal of 500 gigawatts of non-fossil capacity and, and uh, reduce emissions by 1 billion tons by 2030, uh, as per the Paris Agreement India announced at the uh, recent COP26. And, uh, as Mr. Niyogi had uh, outlined earlier, you know, the traditional way to think about 
and COE has been that a large portion of the costs, roughly about 70%, uh, uh, arises from capital cost and time to market, and another 10 to 15% from O&M efficiency, and the remaining from other OPEX, right? And uh, uh, Mr. Kadam also talked about the IT and OT digital system aspects and data being a gold mine. So those are really key components. And for the most part in the last decade, we have seen reduction in LCOE from technology improvements and dramatic decline in costs for wind, solar, and storage. And I think in addition to this, the next wave of efficiency gains and LCOE optimization will come from technologies such as energy storage and flexible energy services and, and the smart platform that can provide this to deliver least cost electricity while achieving the COP26 goals. And I'd like to focus a little bit on this. And, and the framework also has to take into account levelized cost of dispatchable green energy and not just green energy, right? Because uh, we'd like to service a flexible demand when green energy is required the most based on economic value it provides and not just on an intermittent basis. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and, and India is going to have to achieve this against the backdrop of a few key macro trends laid out here. Urban population is, is going to double by 2030. Electricity demand in India, both the energy and peak power, is estimated to increase at a CAGR of 5% in the foreseeable future. And most of this growth will be driven by a significant agricultural load, increasing share of residential and commercial demand. These factors are by no means exhaustive, but it gives a sense of the evolution of the power demand uh, in India uh, in, in the uh, next few years. Next slide, please. So we, we talked a little bit about this, uh, the other speakers earlier. Uh, you know, this demand growth, it'll come with substantial intraday and intra-seasonal variability. For instance, the average yearly max minus min demand gap has increased by 17 gigawatts with a CAGR of 14% per annum. Min-max demand gap as percentage of peak demand is also increasing, underlining the heightened demand volatility and, and emphasizes the need to create a market for dispatchable renewable generation and, and make that happen in the Indian grid. This only means demand management will also get increasingly complex for discoms and system operators. This additional complexity will emerge as we move to faster and, and, uh, and, and the spot markets, that is five minute to 15 minute scheduling, metering, accounting, and settlement in, in the Indian market, leaving little margin for error. And, and Dr. Valvaka earlier also talked about the further impact EV would have on demand as well, so just to underscore the importance of the evolving demand. Next slide, please. This uh, slide, it compares India's supply flexibility to that of other countries relative to the RE as a percentage of total generation. Countries such as US, despite relying on over 320 gigawatt of combined cycle gas turbines for their flexibility, that by the way, are powered by cheap natural gas domestic supplies, speak of the Marcellus, right? They will also be investing in nearly 60 gigawatt of energy storage by 2030, according to an NREL study. Um, on the same vein, Europe will be adding 95 gigawatt and China will be adding 130 gigawatt of storage by 2030 to accommodate their high growth trajectory for renewables. China, you know, we like to speak of China plus one, uh, and, and even in this case, China serves as an interesting case. Uh, China is going to invest in pump storage hydro for almost all of the 130 gigawatt of energy storage. We discussed battery storage a little while ago and the PLI scheme support, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Valvakar also talked about the fire issues and the warranty issues in the U.S. with some of the big, some of the biggest developers. We really need to understand the battery physics and and the chemistry aspects of uh, 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 of the battery best uh, uh, a little better for for uh, uh, more investments to come into that space and really build out this massive 100 to 150 gigawatt scale we're talking about. Ten years ago, you know, I conducted a DOE study recommending pump storage, and DOE only recently is trying to expedite even the U.S. Uh, approval framework to make more pump storage happen. So, and I think India can also build a lot of the pumped hydro. It's a very well-established and understood technology, right? So, 
So the increased share of RE in the generation mix combined with the pause and build out of supply to the flexible supply, and India has got issue, its own issues with gas infrastructure. So with uh, lesser and lesser of a pondage-based hydro and natural gas, this will lead to significant issues in demand and grid management. And it can have dramatic commercial and technical implications, right? financial implications. And given that RE is must run in India, energy resource mix is also bound to change as a percentage of the ins installed capacity. Uh, next slide, please. So to that end, uh, creation of energy storage model of the equation will be critical to enable uh, capacity build. And energy shifting and RE integration will be a key utility requirement for storage, moving away from the sub-hourly one hour to all the way to four, six, and even nine hour use cases to enable uh, decarbonization of the entire grid across sectors. Currently, most of uh, the flexibility is provided by thermal and hydro. And in the current regime, backing down thermal leads to inefficiencies and extra fixed cost and variable cost for discounts. Just take a look at the peak and off peak market pricing, right? And day ahead and even the green energy markets on Indian energy exchanges. This will serve as a market signal for the flexibility that is really required uh, for both the supply and demand side of the equation. Um, I've outlined here, you know, uh, a couple of important parameters from a recent CEA study that indicates without storage, India would need a, a, a net coal addition of 60 gigawatt by 2030. And over 100 gigawatt of coal capacity will operate at a PLF of 15 to 40% and be, risk being stranded. So just think about the financial costs involved there. And, and, as, the, and as the base load coal, thermal coal um, PLF drops to levels as low as 15 or 20 percent, the cost can rise up to 10 rupees a kilowatt hour. So, so the grid balancing requirements will require increased, you know, with the increased RE penetration, um, a lot of studies indicate uh, we will see hourly ramps as high as 60 gigawatts within one hour. And this can be planned for and managed in a least cost manner using storage and, and uh, uh, offering green solutions to the grid. And uh, we, we talked about you know, the impetus that Ministry of Power has recently provided. Uh, you know, they provided clarification regarding usage of ESS, the energy storage systems and various applications across the entire value chain of power sector. So that's very encouraging. CERC has also come out with regulations to reform the ancillary services market with clarifications on the type of ancillary services, the market participation, and the incentive mechanisms. Next slide, please. So this, this is the case of a classic duck curve that we all like to look at. And it, it currently occurs in some major markets like California, Germany, and Australia. But prices not only stay under zero, but also go negative in some cases. And it also poses multiple operational challenges, and it leads to increase in grid costs. So this example here, this is the duck curve uh, forecast uh, it's an Indian version, if you will, on a typical day in 2030 uh, with an installed capacity of uh, uh, an estimated capacity of 775 gigawatt. So in order to accommodate even a min load of 55% for coal plants in our existing stack, India will need a storage capacity of 120 gigawatt um, or 700 gigawatt hour with, a, with six hours of storage. So just this massive size of the problem, you know, th there's, there has to be a lot of work done and like Dr. Walwalkar said, we need to stop looking at slides and uh, uh, get capacity hitting the ground, you know? Uh, next slide, please. And at the same time, we need to ensure reliability of grid operations. This will necessitate robust wholesale energy markets and other services, including ancillary services and energy storage services. India will have to use techno-economic studies for load forecasting, and to procure competitive technology and solutions for both resource adequacy and resource procurement while incorporating the current environment, you know, that multiple states have their own ways of looking at things, but we need to look at this in an integrated manner and as a nation as a whole. And India will also have to implement market reforms 
and participation rules for energy storage. We are definitely making a lot of strides in that aspect. Uh, this will really enable the LDCs also to uh, uh, ensure a smooth uh, uh, operation of the grid, even at higher RE levels. And as far as for wholesale markets, uh, previously dominated by legacy long-term PPAs, we are moving from a market that has been rigid to a market with bespoke solutions, including peak supply, flexible supply, and even shorter term PPAs. That will in turn uh, uh, allow market participants to grow deeper energy markets on the exchanges or what have you. Ancillary service markets will also have to be expanded to include innovative products like ramping, fast response, frequency response, uh, and not just the RRAS type of services. And, and like I said, India is definitely moving in strides to enable this ecosystem. Um, next slide, please. So with that, you know, focus will definitely be on integrated planning, forecasting, and intelligent renewable energy plus storage portfolio management from a supply and demand integration perspective. Uh, a few of the operational aspects of optimizing the costs around green energy are laid out here. The, the shift to green energy sources uh, is going to definitely bring a structural shift in, in energy market design itself and the infirm and volatile nature of wind and solar at high penetration, right? Uh, for example, 50% or even higher of demand by 2030 can be very costly, both commercially and technically, if not managed reliably. So we, we, we currently have live real world examples from markets such as California or Germany, and even in India, where the volatility has impacted day-to-day -day operation. So for higher penetration of renewables, um, we, we need, uh, in order to optimize the costs uh, at a systemic level and meet flexible growing demand, we'll need scientific data-driven approaches and not spreadsheet type of models to enable procuring and selling power on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of the main components would be, you know, these uh, themes uh, keep getting thrown around a lot, but, you know, just to underscore uh, some of those things would be AI and machine learning, as well as econometric-based forecasts for demand, renewable energy, and power prices, by considering factors like temperatures, wind speeds, humidity, historical demand patterns, upcoming changes to the supply stack, and, and so on and so forth. The platform will also need an optimization framework based on least cost production systems while integrating real-time decision support systems like we talked about the IT, OT, and the SCADA side earlier and, and bring the weather forecasts uh, into, the, into the forum and orchestrate either individual assets or at a portfolio and na nationwide level to meet various kind of flexible demand obligations. And an important aspect of this optimization framework is to not only to meet certain business objectives such as you know clean energy targets and megawatt hours or co2 co2 emission basis but like mr niyogi had said before we need to do this in a cost effective way and financially optimized way and not just on on energy basis and um, platform would have to be able to uh, facilitate various contract structures you know we talked about plain rtc versus 24 by 7 uh, uh, clean energy, right? So the 24 by 7 is a well-accepted global uh, 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 phenomena now, moving away from, you know, uh, whenever the wind blows or sun shines to really enabling 24 by 7 green energy. And and we'd also have to bring into this framework the uh, uh, aspects around uh, the stochastic nature and the probabilistic nature of uh, uh, the, the volatility around uh, renewable energy. So the whole decision-making has to be on a risk-adjusted financial basis, thereby uh, reducing costs and servicing these obligations uh, from residential, CNI, and DISCOM's perspective in a reliable manner on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide, please. So just to summarize some key contributors to, to enable this least cost pathway um, are laid out here um, and by no means exhaustive, but through my lens, the, the world has seen dramatic cost reductions, um, uh, you know, over 90% cost reductions in uh, uh, storage as well in the last decade. And, and this will continue to happen for wind, solar and storage. 
India will need to take advantage of these macro trends and, and this will enable India to build a green, flexible and sustainable electric grid. And as far as energy storage, investments in energy storage, like much of the uh, rest of the world, will be a key enabler um, in, in, in allowing us to go from what I consider even a phase one or two, where RE has minor to moderate impact on system operation, to phases four, five, and six, where RE makes up almost all of the generation and creates RE surplus even from days to weeks. And, um, and lastly, um, India will need to foster a development of wholesale energy and capacity markets at a nationwide level with tight integration to state resource procurement mechanisms. And on that note, I would like to end the presentation and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Happy to uh, take any questions. Uh, Mr. Jam Jamkani, th thank you. And uh, you, you have uh, basically left, uh, left the discussion from where uh, Mr. Alam had started. So, you know, you have spoken about the smart platform, you have spoken about the essentially the digital solutions, uh, uh, which, uh, which all of which had, had been flagged by Mr. Kadam in the evening, in, in, the, in the beginning. And secondly, you know, you have also floated a very interesting concept. You know, we, in the earlier session, you know, we, in the earlier talks, uh, we had heard about uh, least cost, uh, uh, levelized cost, rather than the levelized cost of uh, delivered power. Now you have cost of, uh, talked about the levelized cost of dispatchable power. So that, that's basically going to make the differentiation. So Mr. thank you. And you know, if, if, the, if, the, if there is a Q&A at the end of the session, you know, we'll come back to you. With that, can I uh, request uh, Mr. Upathai to come in please and provide us his perspective, especially from the policy context. Mr. Patel. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, India Smart Grid Forum, for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, about the pricing scenario. So my previous speaker has already spoken about the various term and technology, and uh, they have given much emphasis uh, on the on the management at the plant level and management at the, as a dispatch level. So uh, like, uh, I want to just bring out some major challenges and major issues that, that green energy pricing is facing and uh, some of the work that Niti wanted to start and some of the work that Niti is doing and uh, wanted to inform audience that uh, what actually would be the uh, forecasting for this, uh, this sector. So, like uh, uh, Rahul started this conversation of the RTC versus uh, uh, non-RTC R availability of four to six R. So we are witnessing a huge paradigm shift uh, in the price. Uh, we have 24 gigawatt of solar power, which is not tied up, and uh, it is still lying even after the tenders. After tenders, it was earlier 19 gigawatt, 19 gigawatt. Now it is 24 gigawatt. And though we are continuously discovering the lowest price, so lowest was 1.99, and then it is moved to uh, uh, after two uh, rupees. Though even this this comps are not ready to sign PSA and PPA. Uh, the reason is no unknown because uh, they they wanted to renegotiate uh, the price because they say that the latest price is the final price, and we all know that the this comps is tend to buy the buy the power as they are. Uh, they are they're financially not viable in a lot of discoms, especially in other uh, state discoms, the agricultural state discoms, they are not financially viable. And they are putting more thrust on the short term purchase from the uh, from the exchange to have to minimize their purchase power. And they don't want it to take four or six hour power, they wanted to take the RTC power. That is one very biggest challenge for, for policymakers and how to accommodate all type of power. And then the recent trend, like there is only one, one or two tender for the RTC power, where we've seen that there is a combination of uh, of the fuel, uh, including renewable and non-renewable. And we have already seen that there is a large capacity, especially 34 to 35 gigawatt uh, coal capacity, which is not utilized. And there is policy called mega power policy. There is other policy, Sakti policy under that, 5 gigawatt somewhere, somewhere 10 gigawatt. So the, the plants are lying still without utilization are they're facing some issue because they're not getting dispatch 
and if we see that there is a lot of price variation between solar and wind and biomass so if, till now we have only focus on the solar the wind especially that that time when there was only cost plus basis the wind was doing good and they are, they, they are getting their cost plus price after the reverse bidding so though the price has come down but the but the development in the wind sector is almost nil we have seen only uh, 2 to 3 gigawatt installation after 2018 and though we have almost 36 gigawatt attended awarded then uh, what is the real exact discover price for the rtc power which include the scenario of the battery plus re psp plus re or we can combine all battery psp whatsoever it is and we are seeing that there is a new emergence of fuel called green hydrogen and for that we have seen a green hydrogen strategy and the policy from ministry of power where uh, they have come out with the itc waiver and all this thing till now we have not seen any forecasting that they have included ict ists waiver in their projections and every solar power developer they they wanted to go for ist waiver and other waivers recently there were 12 major changes in the tax and that has impacted the solar price very hugely hugely so a dif different scenario is emerging in the solar sector where the state is thinking now the time to reap the solar development they wanted to make profit from solar power is still thrust is to have maximum solar uh, energy because you want to reach 500 gigawatt of target and uh, then the price scenario so the new emergence of the green uh, green hydrogen again is going to put lot of lot of incentive thrust on the solar side because 1 kg production of the green hydrogen uh, is consuming 55 uh, unit of the solar power and if you uh, control solar power then only you can uh, achieve the price priority in the green hydrogen so again to push solar there will be other incentive maybe in by state and central government and that is again going to load on the tradition so whatever incentive it is to shift on the traditional power and we have seen a, a huge a huge coal shortage uh, last year and that uh, that has occurred uh, a different policy scenario so seeing these this type of emergence uh, where we are not seeing any energy mix uh, development where we are not seeing the trend of anything so there is a basically transition transition in the pricing transition in the technology even transition in the policy so for us this is challenge to how how to go for it so niti wanted to have establish so we have we are in process to establish energy modeling scenario energy modeling unit where we are going to see the net zero pathway as well as we wanted to start this price uh, energy price predictability so it is not like uh, like uh, we are going to predict price but we wanted to see scenario of different uh, fuel mix and what would be the all india price purchase price because the all india purchase price is still higher so we have one one side we have a lowest solar power and uh, one side we have we are we are planning to take solar in different way but the all india procurement procure price is still high it's, it's, it's touching around 4 4 rupees per unit and every state is wanted wanted to minimize, minimize this thing by doing some other uh, other way so for us to have a have a trained as scenario for that and we can see that what type of fuel mix and and the, and the promotion policy for that and what type of incentive that we are providing and balancing this so there will be scenario 1 2 3 where we can see that this may be a energy uh, price trend that we wanted to develop and it is not started but we are hopeful that will develop soon and the modeling unit that is going to 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 uh, have a net zero road map because that zero road map is very important right now as we have almost uh, already five uh, pointer given by pm so that is this is also going to impact the price the green energy price because we wanted to achieve maximum renewable energy 50% uh, generation a uh, contribution from renewable side and then 1 billion ton of the uh, ghg emission reduction so again the the thrust is going to shift on the on the on the on the green energy side so for that if we have a road map that is going to help us to understand the pricing trend as well and the fund required to establish this this, this, uh, this pricing trend so what actually uh, is required one the first thing is that we have established uh, in a short term gain that the low Uh, finance is a major uh, contributor of the energy pricing, and if we achieve uh, one or two percent of the interest rate uh, uh, fund, that is uh, ideal because we compare uh, our energy pricing scenario from uh, from Oman, eventually the Middle East, which where solar radiation is highest, and 
uh, and uh, we wanted to compare also to the Chile and Morocco as well, where the green hydrogen production is started and they are they are pushing a lot. So we see that we have a 20% disadvantage in the Middle East and India because we have a 20% lower GHI, though we have a cheap manpower and other things. But the land cost and the GHI, GHI is is a major contributor in the in the capex of that one. So to balance out this uh, this uh, twenty percent uh, extra cost for the renewable energy for the green hydrogen production, we are uh, we are recommending in the green hydrogen policy that how to how to balance out these things. So we have seen that there is a uh, less than one rupees uh, per unit in the Oman. Uh, there is there is point seven six or point seven five rupees per unit energy pricing. So it's solar pricing, and we have is still uh, two point two zero two point three zero. So uh, the first thing is the lowest uh, lowest uh, uh, funding, uh, and second point is that how we are going to maximum uh, uh, maximum pension fund are the fund which is uh, which is available at almost zero cost. Then the the the, the policy and tax stability because the policy and tax stability is uh, is basically putting lot of a uh, lot of pressure on the developer because. They are not getting passed through because of the change of law. They are a change of law uh, rule in the tenders, but the forms are not allowing. And SCR, SCRC is also not putting this change of law as an implementation. They take two, two and a half year to implement this change of law. So we wanted to see that how we can make this policy and tax stability for at least ten years for for the entire green energy sector. And then uh, we are also bringing out the energy policy. So it's called energy. Uh, policy that is in form of energy vision document, uh, where uh, the combination of scenario for the demand and supply side, the net zero scenario, and then the funding requirement, the energy uh, uh, productions, and the suggestions and, uh, and and the industry concern on the taxes that we are basically putting for discussion. So uh, these are the these are the activity that Niti Aayog is doing and, and planning, and we are happy to take uh, take suggestions from industry that. That how to manage uh, manage the entire renewable energy portfolio, especially in the transition mode for the integration point of view for the variability, and how to basically balance the energy pricing. So balancing energy pricing means the discom is able to uh, go for it because right now discom is not basically attracting towards the towards the uh, the solar pricing, and uh, we have also started the off grid uh, uh, offshore uh, wind. So uh, there is a lot of emphasis on the upgrade, upgrade wind, and uh, the the entire management of the uh, price because uh, there is also uh, there is also thrust on the floating solar like lot of NTPC is doing lot of uh, MOU and understanding with the uh, different uh, uh, thermal power companies. So again, uh, uh, we don't know that cost plus basis price is going to sustain our tender basis because they are not doing tender basis pricing. So it's basically like cost basis pricing. So there is a different different scenario where where we are basically doing analysis and out with some some recommendable scenario, and we we invite industry view if uh, if they have any uh, suggestions uh, to Niti Aayog and Niti Aayog can help help them to have a, a uniform policy. We have started asking one nation one price. This is very different scenario, and eventually the other state where the renewable energy is not in a in, in a very big way, they'll also start uh, thinking about one nation one price. For the electricity, it is a very challenging task, but we have to think how to make the uniform pricing for the for the state because they have a 20 to 30 tariff slabs. So how to minimize their tariff slabs? How to make them a uh, then uh, a uniform uh, thing? The challenges that we are facing, and we are basically uh, doing a lot of work on that way. So uh, this is uh, it from my side, and I'm, I'm open to take questions uh, on on the green energy pricing and other initiative by Niti. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Upadhyay, thank you very much. And uh, you have ended on a positive note. And and in fact, uh, uh, from the industry's point of view, we have been always encouraged by the openness uh, Niti Aayog has demonstrated in engaging with stakeholders and seeking suggestions. So that's why, you know, as a group, we are making progress. So thank you very much, uh, you know, uh, for reiterating that. And you have also flagged a few issues, like you know, discoms are not signing PPAs; they are not in a position to lift the power that's coming into the market, and that's obviously is proving a dampener for further development of the sector. 
and uh, you know our on onward march to to embracing more and more renewables uh, secondly you have also talked about uh, a, a, a pertinent point that you know there is a differential in tariff between solar and wind wind in fact in other geographies solar and wind compete with each other almost uh, on an equal tariff basis almost you know because you know they are converging and if you uh, have seen the lcoe graph that has come down for both solar and wind wind in in, in, in almost globally you know it, they are basically at a point of convergence now that is really a a, a serious concern especially because uh, if we have to achieve 140 gigawatts of wind by 2030 which is the target you know under 435 gigawatts of renewables then it requires almost 10 gigawatts of addition per annum so that's a huge challenge and unless you know that the, there is a re-engineering of the tariff and as you rightly said you know flag the financing cost being considerably higher in our case compared compared to other jurisdictions so that the, the, that's we're going to be a handicap and we are talking of LCOE. And thirdly, you know, we have also talked about offshore wind and we haven't made much progress. And here, of course, uh, you know, the technology, siting, sizing, everything will, will have a role. So we, we have to cover sufficient ground. But having said that, you know, we also find that uh, Nitya was so seized of uh, coming out possibly with an integrated energy policy that's what we will expect because we can't just uh, have electricity under energy policy so and especially because of the constraints that are now arising in terms of uh, geopolitical scenarios like you know our reliance on oil gas etc so we would certainly like an integrated energy policy to be uh, to be worked upon by niti ayog with the engagement of stakeholders and secondly, we also take encouragement from the fact your statement that, you know, you're, you're talking of an energy transition modeling so that, you know, there is a net zero pathway. And we have the price balance also taking place. So with those remarks, you know, I leave it at this stage and, and we'll come back to you once we have come to the end of the session with uh, questions uh, which you can uh, address both from the speakers and from the audience and may i now invite uh, our next speaker abhishek to come and give us uh, almost a 360 degree view being the utility he is now with an re developer so he's very much into i would say new age technologies so over to you abhishek Are you there? I will just call him just a minute, sir. I think he is on, yeah. uh, he is unmuted himself, but there is some problem. I think I'll just call him. Or should we spare, spare move over to the next speaker? Yes, we can move, sir. Okay. So, Mr. Dave, then, you know, uh, once again, you know, from uh, you know, uh, from uh, get, get from the developers as well as being a manufacturer. So you can provide us uh, uh, your perspective, your context, and your take on LCOE, Mr. Dave. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it, it is definitely a nice uh, opportunity given by ICAW to discuss openly about the different aspects of the renewable power and the grid integration. <laughs> I had uh, my presentation, which is uh, trying to touch upon the technical aspects more uh, rather than on a cost aspect. Being an engineering person, I try to touch upon the finer aspects of uh, renewable power generation, its grid integration challenges, and what could be the way forward based on the experience we had and uh, projects we developed uh, recently in uh, renewable portfolio level. So I would request Mr. Kundu to uh, run through the presentation, or should I share? Okay, I will run through not
So, yeah, uh, this is just a warm-up uh, slide, introduction on an Indian grid scenario. Uh, India has achieved a cumulative installed capacity of renewable energy, excluding uh, large hydro, around uh, 92.54 gigawatt, close to 200 gigawatt, out of which around uh, almost 5.5 gigawatt is added in last uh, one year, one and a half year time. And the share of renewable energy in uh, this particular is approximately today is around 27 percentage of the total installed generation capacity. Uh, the numbers I have taken from uh, public domain and it is in terms of the installed capacity, not in terms of the energy level, because I think my earlier speakers talked about energy and energy may be slightly lower because of the lower CUF we have in uh, renewable plants. And uh, yes, we, uh, under the leadership of government and government of India and Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi, we have a target of uh, going with 450 gigawatt of RE power by 2030, which is committed to Paris uh, Forum. And uh, then we move on to next slide. So, uh, if we talk about the grid integration and challenges, uh, RE generator or RE developer or uh, RE uh, power uh, faces, uh, uh, some of the points I try to capture are intermittency because uh, solar and wind sources are highly intermittent in terms of the nature because it is uh, not in our control. So, this for the scheduling and forecasting accuracy is remain always a challenge. Uh, for any any grid operator or any developer to identify and uh, and, and give a reasonably accurate forecast because there are a lot of uh, issues like uh, cloud cover, wind gust, fluctuation in output that is covered in the large ramp up issues. Frequency response uh, frequency response from the RE power will be definitely will remain the weak because there is no positive response unless it is curtailment. There are guidelines required that there should be a positive response from the frequency in terms of frequency. Uh, when there is a frequency going down, uh, RE power should be able to generate uh, additional, but technically, which is not feasible because the source is not in our control. So it ultimately leads to the curtailment of the power. Short circuit ratios of this all RE generator, whether it is a solar or wind, is very weak in terms of the fault feeding because they are current source generation. There is no kinetic inertia. It is all developed with the, based on the power electronics in terms of either inverter or converter in the WTG. In terms of the reactive power handling capability, definitely this uh, with the advent of uh, new, te uh, new technology of inverters and uh, uh, what we call the WTG converters with the uh, defect uh, technologies, they, there is a queue support uh, available in terms of uh, supporting to the grid when there is a voltage crisis, but uh, it has a very limited queue capability uh, per se. And uh, since the generation is in a distributed manner, there are issues with uh, voltage profiles at uh, tail feed generator, either in terms of inverter or in terms of WTG. So overall, you can say that uh, uh, the our RE generator, whether it is inverter or converter, has a very limited Q capability due to uh, which can be supported to grid. So these are some of the areas which leads a lot of studies and a lot of uh, handhold with uh, RE developer as well as the grid operator, so that a common workable solution can be work penetration and better reliable operation of the RE powers. Mr. Kondu, we can move to next slide. Yeah, I try to demonstrate the intermittency of the renewable. The uh, ABO graph is the generation pattern of a daily generation pattern with a, on, a, on a yearly basis for the solar. And the bottom one is for the wind. Renewable energy and intermittency go in hand in hand due to the inherent nature of this, both, uh, both for the solar as well as the wind. And the pattern of daily and the yearly are varying. The maximum uh, CUF uh, for solar project is in terms of 29 to 30 percent with present new technology available as of today. Whereas the wind, it is ranging from 30 to 45 percent. It widely varies for a country like India, where we have a lot of diversified wind patterns uh, to east and south to west. So 
it is a large uh, cuf variation uh, in terms of 30 to 45 percent the intermittency of this renewable power source become more pronounced as the share of renewable is going to increase in the grid and availability and serviceability of balance uh, conventional uh, generators like gas thermal hydro and batteries become more uh, important and the integration which i think discuss uh, in detail by so that we need to have a more common and integrated solution which is going to help the more penetration of the re power we can move on to the next slide so one of the possible solution of uh, removing partly the intermittency it, if not in full but we can uh, reduce the dependency and intermittency if we go for the hybridization and at adani we have recently in last six to eight months time we have a exposure of uh, doing the large hybrid solar and wind project in rajasthan almost uh, 1.7 gigawatt of projects are recently commissioned and uh, this definitely hybridization of solar and wind will give better utilization of grid infrastructure lower generation variability due to uh, hybridization but again difficult challenges uh, for, for a country like india says that we have a very uh, limited potential area like kutch in gujarat and rajasthan jaisalmer where both solar and wind resources make uh, are, are available and you can think of doing the hybridization uh, project if we go to further south we have a better wind but not much of solar potential uh, those kind of the challenges are there so we can move uh, next slide please mr kundu further definitely hybridization leading to the conventional gas and thermal with around the clock uh, kind of a rtc bids are already there from seki renew and other players have successfully uh, won those bid and uh, it is going to help up to certain extent about uh, developing uh, reducing the interdependency inter intermittency and uh, it will lead to the smooth generation because uh, you know that uh, when when there is no wind and so we can depend upon the conventional uh, power and as of today most of the plant are required to thermal plant are required to operate on a technical minimum so there is definitely a cost involved uh, in operation of this plant which can be integrated with uh, solar and uh, wind patterns to get a better overall uh, cuf of the uh, plant uh, next slide mr kundu yeah and definitely the solution could be application of uh, energy storage energy storage can be in terms of uh, different uh, mechanism which are available battery uh, Mr. dr rahul has discussed a uh, lot technical and commercial aspect about the battery storage and technology available pump hydro yes uh, government of india mnre and niti aayog is coming with a lot of pump hydro tenders compressed air not up to the very high level so and again these are the technology driven items and which has still not reached up to the large scale level where it can help to the grid so these are some of the area where we can work about the storage which will help us smoothen the uh, grid pattern uh, next slide mr kundu these are the uh, i tried to capture the lvrt hvrt frequency response and ramp rate requirement typically from our ca and uh, most of the grid in global has this kind of the requirement uh, which are supposed to be demonstrated but again uh, lvrt hvrt capability at poc is definitely desired and uh, sometimes uh, people do talk about the testing of this at poc level but uh, those things are still not available technically so uh, people oems are providing the tests and the testing certificate and then we have to go with the simulation so one of the things digital twin will come in the picture so uh, next slide uh, mr kundu here we try to touch upon about the reactive power capability of the re power yes as it has been dis discussed that the all uh, wtgs or inverters are distributed to a large network so uh, different voltages we try to project here and uh, if we talk of uh, demonstrating the reactive power capability at ists remote end uh, a point of connection then there are a lot of challenges this the in inbuilt uh, inherent uh, capability of wtg or inverter which is limited 
cannot sustain the overall Q losses of the large reticulation systems as well as the power transformers and the Q losses of the lines. Because per se, what is happening, sir, that uh, I, from ISTS, the PSS of the re, uh, renewable power, which may be solar or wind or hybrid, are ranging from 40 to 70 kilometers at either 220 kV or 400 kV level. And then for if we talk of wind, the wind distribution goes again for the 30, 25 to 30 kilometers. So the large last turbine is as far as 70 kilometer, 80 kilometer from uh, what we can say the ISTS connected POC. And when we talk of demonstrating the reactive power capability, we face a lot of challenges. And then uh, if you operate in the voltage support mode, there are fag, uh, the tail end turbines, tail end inverters are facing the over voltage criteria and it, then it leads to tripping. A lot of, lot of studies are going on. So what could be the uh, possible solution? Next slide, I try to capture uh, some of the things. Uh, Mr. Dave, a small request, uh, if you can please expedite because we have- Yeah, I think this is the last slide, sir. Uh, uh, the, some of the resolution and way forward, we can talk about the digital twins, uh, grid impact studies with actual grid condition on account of integration of RE power, design and planning of overall TND infrastructure. <laughs> Forecasting, we can think of uh, having a centralized forecasting system available, uh, which will be giving a better uh, accuracy rather than depend upon the developer. Then definitely I, I tried to talk from, I think something is discussed recently by uh, Upa, Mr. Upadhyay is on the demand side forecasting also, because uh, we are all talking about the generation forecasting, but we need to work uh, as a country on load management and load side uh, forecasting also. Some of the uh, solution could be ancillary services uh, fast because that will help in fast frequency response, primary frequency response, and load setting. That's all from my end. Uh, thank you very much, uh, ISGF, for providing this opportunity and uh, share the views uh, on technical aspects mainly. Mr. Dave, thank you. And once yeah. again, like the previous speaker, you know, uh, you have touched upon the concept of digital twin. And I, I, I suppose Mr. Kadam uh, would be quite happy because he had initiated the discussion a digital twin. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, and uh, which would start from the, the, the build stage and then integrate uh, and be integrated at the OM stage. So, you, you know, the, the, that's I, very important that, you know, what I fully agree with Mr. Kadam's view that the digital twin is yeah. not limited, supposed to project level, it has to go up to OM stage because. A lot of efficiency improvements are required at ONM stage and which will definitely True. help us in working out the LCOAE. LCOAE reduction by thinking only reduction of capex is not going to help. This is okay. from developer perspective also definitely we are also facing these challenges. And, and the other thing you had touched upon, I think it's going to be very pertinent. See, first of all, grid integration, the subject of grid integration is going to be massive. Yes. Because today it is just about 11%. Yes. Brazil is saying that you know it would be 25% by 2025. And then, of course, we have the national target of achieving 50% by 2030. So yeah. that's going to be a big subject. And you touched upon inverters. And, and as you would know definitely, that inverters would also have a, a role in, in providing the synthetic inertia. Yes. And we would slowly move over or gradually from grid following inverters to grid forming inverters. So exactly. that, that's again a new concept, but the subject never ends. We have the next speaker wa wa waiting, Abhishek. And the way we wanted to, to introduce you, Abhishek, that you have the utility uh, context, you have the RE developer context, and you, of course, have the new age technology perspective. So over to you, Abhishek. Thank you, sir. Am I audible, sir? You are. You are. Thank you. And yeah, so over the past one, one and a half hours, I was listening to the very esteemed speakers and uh, very enlightened to see the ways in which the LCOE can be reduced. And of course, technology plays a very important role. And thank you, ISGF, for this opportunity. In the next five to 10 minutes, I would uh, not like to repeat whatever has already been said. Uh, many of things have been already said, but I try to reiterate what is more desired. So this is an uh, introduction about the company where I work on right now. So the largest uh, RE uh, energy company in terms of the installed portfolio, 7 gigawatt plus and 3 gigawatt plus in pipeline. 
but renew does not stop over there they have ambitions to uh, be a vertically integrated utility so they have ventured out into already a, a transmission business one of the ifts business they are uh, developing in karnataka as per the public reports and they have also the intentions to enter into the distribution side of the business hence i am uh, here so uh, next slide please uh, sk yeah so what is the context we are talking about i mean a target we all know uh, 500 gigawatt the technical challenges the commercial challenges now uh, also the variable renewable energy sources like solar and wind they have achieved grid parity in fact they are uh, much lower than the total cost of the thermal and in fact some of the cases it is much lower than the variable cost of the load centered thermal stations also very important example and uh, pertinent example is the case of dadri plant in the city of delhi for example where delhi discoms existed at, uh, very recently now but the thing is the variability issue is very very important now there are two aspects to it one is the technical aspects another is the commercial aspect so when i say commercial it is mainly about the deviation settlement as it happens and uh, we have a draft regulation also in place now uh, today ari generation is having a must and status it may lose it as it becomes mainstream okay now uh, just like hydro in hydro projects spillage minimization is the priority priority ari curtailment also needs to be minimized so this is the context i am trying to set up resource adequacy study will be ensuring optimized levelized cost of energy for the utilities not only green energy so when i say resource adequacy it is not only from the supply side but also from the demand side i have two slides on that and so you you need to have a complete overview of the portfolio load assessment development and which will be important for a load following re products development so the idea is load following it's not only about hybridization of solar and wind with the battery storage but how it can mimic very closely the existing load profile and that's what we'll try to see next slide please now firm load following re is the objective so yes we started with rtc1 co located solar wind hybrid etc and then now uh, we are moving to the round the clock albeit with the minimum cof mandates and these could be at different locations as well oversizing blending with hydro battery energy storage are the options which are being used to achieve the rtc profile we saw that in rtc1 and rtc2 but that is being achieved using cof mandates as i am saying now the time block wise that means meaning megawatt based because uh, you need some firmness in terms of megawatt for the grid deviation and grid discipline re firm re profile needs to have load following characteristics and that will help in optimizing in the levelized cost of energy co located re generation sources shall give away to the multi location and capacity credit so some study was were done uh, last year where say capacity credit of wind resources based in tamil nadu visavi gujarat with the load profile of delhi was studied it was found out that capacity credit of tamil nadu based wind is more 60 plus 60% plus uh, with the load profile of delhi similar kind of studies need to be done across studies across the country and we have one nation one grid concept so capacity credit studies of re across the sources and demand of a uh, different regions need to be co studied and then we can find out varied re profiles matching with the load profile the need for say project specific uh, you know firming up the re uh, product for a particular state will be costly but if we uh, you know do some uh, i mean local multi location wise that will actually lead to the socialization of the cost now designing the uh, utilizing the complementarity in the demand uh, for example the demand across the different states just like we have banking products so banking is being done in himalayan states versus delhi and our main like mp etc because they have a different supply and demand characteristics similar kind of concept has to be there in re rich state uh, uh, versus the demand of the different states and uh, uh, how to co optimize uh, one such attempt was made by an rel study and i think with the resource adequacy regulations being uh, worked upon by the honorable commission that will become very very important for all the states and not individually in silos but as a complete region based and then complete uh, country based next slide please so uh, this is our idea um, my idea of like for example you want to achieve around the clock re with uh, optimized lcoe 
you need to have re generation profiles with higher capacity credits vis a vis the demand profile the regional hourly load profiles and the dsm interventions including uh, this is this dsm is demand side management not the divisions including vpp virtual power plant and obviously you need to talk about a copper plate scenario uh, that means the transmission availability the links interregional links all these together taken comes very important here at uh, transmission grid substations maybe at not not much different if you see 2.90 first year for rtc1 escalated at 3% that is about 3.5 3.44 rupees levelized now in rtc2 where thermal was also supposed to be integrated you had rates as low as 3.01 going up to 3.45 something like that or uh, which were uh, supposed to and i i think it is still under work so 3.5 3.6 rupees per unit kind of rtc that to load following uh with firmness without uh, the need for ancillary service support these kind of product if utilities are uh, being given it is much better than today for example in power exchanges you have rtc rates of 5 rupees 50 paise or something like that so much volatility is there so this is achievable using and further optimization as we spoke about in the previous slides next slide please <clears throat> so this is an example of a load following re generation profile for 12 months in a year and typically for a city like delhi or northern region and it has quite a load following characteristics the middle portion you see is mostly the summer months where the load is almost uniform uh, almost uniform so re generation profile is almost uniform whereas in the bottom part which is the winter the re generation also has drooping characteristics so as the demand so these kind of uh, generation profiles can easily be met through hybridization maybe through oversizing a uh, best integration and very importantly now demand side management and demand response which becomes very important in delivering a levelized cost of energy next slide please so demand side management i have these the last two slides uh, regulatory position in california i mean it has already been recognized as a most clean and a cheapest dispatchable resource that the summary of the slide is it is already there and uh, the pie chart over here it it shows what is the kind of dr plus prm 15% is almost 3% it has reached the 3% uh, uh, of the total capacity which is being done over here so it is very important from especially for the duck cover management also so resource adequacy has to be and it is being done over there the utilities have to mandatorily file it on an annual basis and therefore the demand side demand response actually becomes very very handy in minimizing the overall levelized cost of energy next slide please so uh, importance of resource adequacy can never be reemphasized Uh, this is a key driver for dsm as a dispatchable resource is uh, re integration and attain zero carbon status optimize optimal utilization of the variable generation and transmission distribution resources avoid incidence of grid outage due to say for example if the demand is going up in the peak scenario where the supply is on a shortfall side can you hear me hello abhishek we have lost on the nrel uh, okay am i am i audible lost. abhishek you have to go back uh, just a couple of points because we had lost you in between okay okay am i am i audible now yeah you are audible you can start with this slide sure sure thank you so the importance for resource adequacy in india uh, for uh, demand response or dsm can never be reemphasized Uh, we know and there are some indications that resource adequacy related regulations are being worked upon in the india at the federal regulator level what are the key drivers of demand side management as a dispatchable resource these are the top four drivers for the same one of course is the our cop 26 goal and integration of the re but also commercially it makes important sense 
there are periods in a day where the prices on the exchanges are very very high real time market or even the day head market that point in time this can be dispatched demand response can be dispatched and together it can help shape the demand so if you help shape the demand that means you are trying to bring the demand curve or the load curve very close to the generation curve or regeneration curve makes a commercial sense as well as technical technical sense as well now there was some study done by nrel for bscs some time back and they said that there is a kind of uh, opportunity over there in peak reduction potential of 2% in summers and about 4% in winters and this is the top 5% of the hours of the load duration curve where there is expected a shift in in the demand uh, due to the demand response and the tod rates induced demand response for example so demand response as i say is very very vital in optimizing the levelized cost of green energy these are some of the recommendations in the uh, bottom part i think uh, this is my last slide I, next slide is it there summary slide or something sk can you please uh, move on to the next one yeah so pan india demand supply analysis to uh, key uh, identify complementarity in demand has to be there capacity credit identifications for multi locations wind and solar mapped with the pan india supply demand analysis virtual transmission also will help create a copper plate kind of scenario which will facilitate optimal re sources utilization across geographies improve upon re forecasting both the day ahead and intraday becomes very very important and now we should integrate the fns forecasting and scheduling of the re with the real time market which is not very much present over there right now and flattish rtm um, rtc profile of uh, re is not needed it is increasing the lco is not required at all it has to mimic the load profile because it has the flexibility unlike coal where you can't you know schedule it below 55% of its uh, rated capacity technical constraints but in re that is not there so with this i'll end my uh, presentation thanks a lot chair and everybody for a patient hearing thank you yeah, thanks avishek so uh... You know, you have made as a season speaker. You have uh, made the made the made the points like you know, RE has to be integrated in real time with with the power portfolio. That that's an offer. So obviously, LC LCOE is going to be critical. In fact, you know, you have raised an interesting uh, uh, topic of uh, demand side management as well as demand response. You talked about the the uh, the BACS study. with the which in 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 any in had done there is also an in the california context there is also an lawrence buckley study. and you know when they talk of uh, demand response it's uh, you would you would know that it's it's about shaping the curve it's about shifting the load it's about shedding the load and finally they have used the word shimmy which means you know you are you are basically smoothing in the curve in real time basis And, and and by way of automatic controls through a home area network so so the, 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 that's the promise it has in indian context at least for large suppliers but the most important aspects we have touched upon a is the concept of resource adequacy where you know it, it it has to be matched from the supply side as well as the demand side to have a common convergence point and we have also sounded the warning that ari is now must run but let's be aware that it may not be that way it has to compete in the market on merit and that's why lcoe is going to be difficult and again linking up with with with, with what mr kadam had said in the beginning it is essentially the advanced computational power and optimization modules that will have to be run in order to finally arrive at a at a, at a at a at a lcoe uh, which will reflect both lcoe of dispatchable power and lcoe as delivered so with those remarks i'm sorry you know i don't have much time left basically to take it round the speakers but we also have the last speaker in waiting so mr gyani from asia you will now have the last say mr gyani I will just check with them once. I just check.
Hello, uh, sir, is there any technical issue? Mr. Prabir? Uh, sir, I think Mr. Rajiv Gani is there, so we can start. Mr. Gani has just joined because, you know, we had been waiting for him. Mr. Gani, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, moderator, sir, Mr. Niyogi. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I was very well there and I was just witnessing the wonderful presentation. I don't have any presentation. Don't worry. I'll take very, I'll, I'll cover up the time loss which you might have, if any. But as I said, you have the last say in the discussion. So please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope I am audible. Yes, you are. So I represent an organization called International Solar Alliance. This is an intergovernmental treaty based organization wherein all 193 uh, UN member countries are prospective members. And as of now, 103 countries have already signed and 81 are full members. So I'll be speaking on a little broader and, and out of the box of what other speakers have already spoken because uh, there is, they have nothing. Uh, I have left knowledge. All knowledge has been shared <laughs> uh, with due regards to all the knowledgeable speakers till now, uh, starting from Mr. Anil and Rahul and Shashrinivas and Mr. Uh, uh See, what, what we look at the total energy senior uh, if you consider the COP uh, angle, wherein we have to comply with the SDGs, uh, there are three verticals, three pillars of uh, this particular energy sector. One is the, the energy energy access, second is energy security, and third is energy transition. Now, what we are speak, uh, discussing here is basically on energy transition. But uh, to achieve to that particular stage, if I, if I see the global senior role, if I see the total Africa country, uh, the, the major problem is not energy transition. Major problem is energy access and energy security. So uh, considering all those things, and, and also one more point, which I, I may be wrong, you correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong, that uh, the levelized cost of energy doesn't have impact of the transmission loss because at the point of connection only the water cost is there that is the cost of the levelized cost of the particular project so all the, the second the, the thing which is still not uh, taken into consideration is the demand side management so if if uh, suppose uh, uh, there is a demand of about uh, say 100 units i'm giving a simple example and the power generation is also 100 unit it's a win-win situation I'm not considering all the uh, imbalancement of grid and all those things. But if at all the demand decreases, then I think that will be a better opportunity and better economical solution for, uh, for, for these things. For that thing, energy efficiency uh, measure, especially uh, Rahul was speaking about the energy storage is one of the very good solutions. Now, I'll, I'll go a little deeper on decentralized energy generation aspects. Uh, may it be rooftop, may it be the off-grid solar solutions for, for the remote places, uh, mini-grid and many other aspects. Uh, I think, you know, uh, according to my experience, these are the, the, the projects which are dealt by state directly, not by the central government. So many of the aspects doesn't come in on the national forum. So uh, I, I come from Chhattisgarh state. Uh, I have been uh, thousands of installation in all the verticals made the mini grid, made the rooftop, or solar hand pump, or solar pump, uh, and megawatt size, and all the grid that it connected everything. So uh, I have a sense. I don't say I'm expert in this, but I have sense of all these uh, verticals. So uh, according to me, initially, you know, uh, I'll go back when Jawala New Solar Mission was launched. In that case, the Northeast National Solar Mission. Uh, in that case, also the the off grid, the rooftop system was not given too much uh, emphasis. But now in this present phase, uh, forty percent to sixty percent is now I consider as a rooftop system, where it can be a kilowatt or megawatt size. So the best part is that the transmission loss is not at all to be considered in the off de decentralized generation. I'm speaking only of solar because we deal with solar energy. Uh, you know, uh, the primary impact what ISA uh, is doing 
as SDG, SDG number seven, and SDG number thirteen. But it has a direct impact on the secondary SDGs remaining. There are seventeen SDGs. So all the balance fifteen SDGs is also covered automatically through these um, effects. And we, we in India also we have the categorization of uh, the commercial project as well as the social projects. So the social projects are uh, are are affordable because of the the, the commercial project. But we don't consider uh, in our own forum. We don't have any graphs or any uh, research on. What happens? What is the impact of all those things in 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 the overall scenario of the uh, line? This uh, levelized cost of energy because this is not a, a central government nitty uh, gritty or the direct impact project. Though the reportings are there, but uh, this also has a great impact. So we should also consider all those aspects uh, rather than only considering the two rupees cost uh, globally or nationally. That is uh, not the thing. So now it will be a difficult task to reduce cost further. As of now, also the distribution companies, utilities are not agreeing to sign PP. Why? Because everybody knows. I won't go into that details. But simultaneously, we should also have it. It should be a, a marriage between the demand side management and aspect and the levelized cost. Uh, Evolution or the calculations. Uh, if you go to by definition on globe uh, on Google and other social website, uh, there is no link to demand side management with uh, these uh, levelized cost of energy, maybe green energy or any type of energy. Uh, yes, uh, ISA International Solar Alliance, Solar Alliance has one big initiative of one sun, one world, one grid. Under that, it is. Uh, you know, it, it is a global platform wherein all the transmission line can be connected together. So it, it, the, the, the country in which the sun is available, if it is access power, it can tra transmit to the other country where the sun is not there and the demand is there. So this, this project has already been initiated and the uh, government of India is leading this project uh, with the help of Ministry of Renewable Energy and ISA uh, with, with the common goal. That is taking place, that will take some time. Similarly, in India also, we have a national grid and we follow the same pattern. But my request to the uh, the honorary, the learned uh, speakers here also, please do consider decentralized power generation also. And we have should some formula wherein this can be synchronized with the with the with the uh, bigger size of uh, power generation or commercial power generation and have a complete package of levelized power generation. Uh, to the discom, it is not to the to the uh, investor. It is to the discom. It is to the country. Then uh, probably the the people who feel they are at loss will come forward and have a uh, handshaking and do the thing as desired. So that is a very brief thought which I am sharing, and I hand over back to the Niyogi. considering that uh, I have completed my talk in a very limited period. Covering few of the minutes, which are left. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Again, you know, very crisp, crisp, brief, and to the point. You know, so so. Uh, I think you know we have got the essence of what you wanted to say. Just to assure you, you know, when Abhishek talked about uh, demand response, uh, when uh, you know Mr. Jampani spoke about uh, you know flexibility services, so we also had this capsule in mind that what role decentralized the distributed generation can play. And then we do anticipate rooftop, rooftop solar to scale up uh, in, in the years to come. So the flexibility services would certainly have one constituent as load participation. And that, that, would, that would essentially be a demand side result. So we do anticipate that you know DSM, DR, as well as D D DR as a whole, I would say, you know, so, so that would be the universe. DR as a whole, which will include DR as well, you know, would have a bigger role to play in the Indian market context. That's one. Two is, you know, you have emphasized on energy access. That's the point. That's the point. That's why in the, in the opening slide itself, I said that, you know, why it's mission critical. 
and why it, it would be SDG 7 aligned well, once we start talking about LCOE. And to, and to assuage your apprehension, one more point, you know, you said very clearly, yes, two rupees or one rupee, you know, that's, uh, that's you know, we have discussed this before. It doesn't include so many things, including the added cost, uh, you know, of which renewables bring into play, which, which need to be socialized. It does not, of course, include the transmission losses. But at the same time, you know, in this session, you know, I have learned quite a few things, one of which is LCOE of dispatchable power and LCOE of delivered power. So when it is delivered at the consumer's doorstep, it factors in all constituents. So thank you all. Uh, so I don't think, you know, we have the time left for Q&A or taking one more round. Yeah, uh, sir, I will just request all the speakers to put their camera on so that we can take a group photo for this. That's right. Yeah, because you know, when it as it happens, when you when you have a diverse and and a knowledgeable set of speakers, uh, you always run out of time and do little justice to the the Q and A session, which would have further enriched us with the involvement of the audience. So, speakers, thank you so much for your time, and for me, it has been time well spent. And and a few things I I, I can't still resist the temptation of just flagging. One is, you know, we have talked about market design, uh, which is going to be critical in the days to come. The market will be, will have more and more temporal and spatial granularity for which digital solutions would be the key. Two, we have talked about resource adequacy that is going to be extremely critical and resource adequacy has to have a complete modeling of demand forecasting going forward. So it's not only mapping the supply side resources, but also anticipating the demand and finally creating a portfolio of non-fossil fuel based generation combined with fossil fuel based generation that will let us achieve our targets as a nation. And thirdly, last but not the least, you know, we are so encouraged when we hear Niti Ayer working on energy transition model. Uh, basically, to again bring the granularity of price formation in play as to to understand, to, uh, to make everyone realize that, you know, what kind of pricing strategy will make energy affordable, reliable and scalable. With those few words, I think I should bring the uh, session to a close, thanking all the speakers who have contributed handsomely to the discussions. Thank you.